Oh, what's it covered with? What is this nasty slime? Hi, this is William, writer and producer of The Transposition of Chloe Bronte. I thought it would be fun to do a little behind-the-scenes demonstration detailing some of the sound design of the show. So this is not a tutorial, but an overview of the process. As far as spoilers go, this scene is from episode 3, Nightmare. And while explaining the mix, I reference plot points revealed in episode 4, Limits of the Material Plane. The following scene involves the characters Chloe, Max, Being, and Elizabeth. In this scene, Chloe and Max, they are in bed, or rather, they are on their mattress, they don't have a bed, and being the interdimensional entity is visiting Chloe. Let's begin a quick fly-through of the scene for context, and then I'll play the whole thing at the end of this demonstration. The scene runs for about four minutes in total. It starts during a visitation from being. Max. 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 At about 30 seconds, Chloe has another headache, and her missing boot emerges from the wall. <coughs> At 1 minute 20 seconds, Being shakes the wall, attempting to enter our dimension. It's in the wall! Okay, okay. In the wall! At 1 minute 50 seconds, Max exits the sleeping nook, and Being speaks to Chloe. It's... <laughs> At around 2 minutes 50 seconds, we enter Chloe's mind, and hear Elizabeth. Chloe, shut up! Shut up, Chloe. Chloe, shut up! <sighs> Then, around 3 minutes, 20 seconds, the portal closes. <sighs> we'll start at the top of the timeline in the edit and work down through the tracks. This is in Adobe Edition, by the way. Let's begin with Being, played by Aaron B. Lillis. You don't. This is her raw recording. You don't belong there. Several takes of the same line spread out in the scene. You don't belong there. I wanted the character modulated. First as an alien, but also because being is communicating to Chloe through space and time with homemade technology. So, in a separate project file, I manipulated Aaron's voice through a variety of approaches, including altering the duration. You don't belong there. Doubling her voice and changing the pitch. You don't. Adding ring modulation. Belong there. Messing with the frequency range and other techniques. You don't. One of the conceits of the communication technology in the story is that Chloe's brain adapts the more the signal is used. So, over time, the voice is clearer and eventually translated into English, which happens in this scene. You don't belong there. Now, I'll solo the voices of Chloe and Max. Max. Chloe is played by Tanya Milojevich. Max. 
<sighs> Max is played by Christopher Colon. Oh, ow! What'd you do that for? It hit me in the head. With your boots? The other actor in this scene is Titania Gray. She plays Elizabeth. Shut up, Chloe. Chloe, shut up. This character has a heavier reverb as she exists in a different headspace, really inside Chloe's mind. I hate you. I, I hate you. Also, throughout her initial appearances, Elizabeth is panned to the right, at the same value, 75, where 100 would be all the way to the right in a stereo mix. I did this to fix her position in both Chloe and the listener's mind, as a presence, having a specific place in Chloe's life. I hate you. I, I hate you. I hate you. Now, this is Max and Chloe moving around on their mattress, and with their blankets. Although many of the sound effects in the show are from libraries, I did create Foley here and there for more specific sounds reacting to character presence and movement. For example, here I recorded myself rolling around on my own blankets, more or less acting out the scene with Chloe and Max in mind. Then, this fully is panned to match the location of the characters. On that subject, whenever Chloe and Max are in the sleeping nook, Chloe's default position in the stereo mix is slightly to the right, and Max's default position is slightly to the left, 35R, 35L. Though their individual foley follows them around the nook as they move, I like starting with a default position each time we revisit a location to ground the listener just a little bit. Now, here's a little gore, some slime, associated with the boot that flies out of the wall, one of the plot points in the scene. The boot is actually emerging from the interstitial passageway, but this can't really be seen yet by the characters, and hasn't been identified at this point in the story. The supposition is, Anything traveling through the passage that links the various dimensions is covered in this gel-like fluid, a natural result of transposing. The individual sounds include borax, tomatoes, a vacuum suck, a plunger, and different gore and blood libraries. All together with the sounds of the boot added. The high-pitched whine symbolizes Chloe's headache, which triggers the portal on this side of the passage as her brain reacts to being's machine. The headache is made from crystals, sparkles, and screech tones. Once Being tries to exit the passage, it sounds like the alien is caught in the wall. This is because it can't complete the transposition. The rattle you hear is a combination of library sound effects, such as wood cracking, earthquake rattle, and me shaking and clunking one of the doors in my apartment. You can also hear a little bit of slime leaking and dripping through the portal. In this scene, there are nine tracks of character movements in the sleeping nook, and I have them all connected to a single bus. If you haven't used a bus, it's a way to group multiple tracks into one. So whatever you do to the bus happens to all the tracks connected to it. 
This could be volume, panning, or whatever effect you throw on the bus. In this example, I applied the convolution reverb effect in order to make all the sounds I sent to the bus appear to have been recorded in the same space. This convolution reverb effect has a number of presets to mimic the reverb associated with specific spaces such as a classroom, inside a car, a cavern, etc. But what's really cool is you can create your own impulse responses and import them into the convolution reverb. The impulse response is a way to define the reverb in a given space. So I made a handful of recordings in different spaces, the same spaces in which I set the scenes of the story, like the kitchen, that's my kitchen, under a stone bridge. I went out to a park under a stone bridge. Incidentally, this same bridge appears in Star Trek Deep Space Nine on the planet Bajor. That's cool. You can find more thorough tutorials on this technique, but in brief, I recorded a clap in each real-world location, then removed the clap from the recording, leaving only the reverb tail. The filter analyzes this, and then any sound you apply the filter to, it will mimic the reverb as if you initially recorded the sound in that given space. What are you doing? No, nothing. Oh. Not doing anything. What are you doing? No, nothing. Oh. Not doing anything. This was my first go at this technique, and I really liked the results. Specifically, the way it helps to blend separate recordings and worldize voices and sound effects. So here's the sound effects associated with Max when he exits the sleeping nook and enters the bathroom to get materials to clean Chloe's bleeding ears. Whenever we hear someone in the bathroom in the show, again, it's always in the same location through panning to try to help visualize the geography of the apartment. In this case, off to the left, 65 L. This is Max rustling around in the bathroom, which is just a recording of me rustling around in the bathroom. Okay, this is the more sci-fi element of the scene, the portal closing. The portal is the opening on this side of the interstitial passageway. This is made of eight tracks and includes carpet rips to signify space-time tearing, some mechanical gears to signify the aperture of the opening, a firework spinner to indicate the edges of the opening as it contracts in a circular movement, and some data bending and glitches to indicate the technology is not working properly. For more body, some explosion and energy and spawning, like you might hear in a video game. And finally, whooshes for the aftermath of the portal's closure, as the absence of its presence displaces the air in the sleeping nook. Some are dead center, other sounds loop around through panning. Some are pushed to maximum left and maximum right. I wanted to imply a little chaos in the alien's technology. It's unstable, and bits of it fly around. Okay, now we have being itself, its body. Nine layers of insects and slime. Now, some of these tracks are premixes. Whenever I'm creating a discrete sound to be reused again and again, like a walk cycle or a complicated mechanism, I generally work on it in its own timeline and then export the result as a new file. So here's the body of the alien known as being. The premix is built up from one track of slime, then adding another track of slightly different slime and a third track of different slime again. 
topped off with two insects, a track of an idle moth and an idle beetle. I wanted to imply this thing is flying in constant motion from all these cilia that Chloe mentions in episode 1 following Being's first visitation. It, it had six, no, eight legs. N nine legs, max. Maybe ten? <sighs> all wiggling. Max, what do you call that? You know, uh... No, don't do that. That's yuck. Ugh. Celia. Is that what you mean? Y yeah Max. Like, like Celia. Gross. No. Ugh. Naturally, little flecks of slime are tossed off from this constant motion. It's the slime being accumulated while traveling through the interstitial passageway. The chirping you hear is made from monkeys and crystals. That's being speaking in its native tongue. I wanted to suggest an animal, but laced with something ethereal. At this point, we reach a gap in the mix. A subjective sound choice I do in the show to create anticipation. All other sounds in the sleeping nook cut out to make room for Chloe's headache. It isn't meant to be literal. Here are the tracks for Chloe's voice and being's presence alone. <laughs> and... All of Being's body sounds are connected to a bus, so I can pan the whole creature around as it swims through the air, trying to get out of the wall. There are moments throughout the series I call articulations, where being makes a specific movement or exertion with its whole body. For these moments, I combined the bass premix of the body with the sound of ice breaking to imply a certain heft to being's physicality, which is strong enough to affect the fabric of space-time. Now, the really exciting stuff. Crickets. So there are two background tracks in the sleeping nook at nighttime. A track of crickets and a lamp. Both are supposedly outside of the apartment, off to the left, and allegedly we're hearing them through the bathroom window. Since the apartment is really an attic, the lamp is attached to the house just under the peak of the roof outside the bathroom. Now, the last element. Drones. Mm. Most of my sound design includes drones as a subjective experience. Not something the characters hear, just the audience. I use them to indicate doom and gloom, or something wicked this way approaches. Psychological uneasiness, that sort of thing. And that's it, more or less. So there you go. I'd like to remind you, the theme music for the transposition of Chloe Bronte was created by Catherine Seaton. Visit ChloeBronte.com to learn more about our cast and crew. I'll leave you by playing the finished scene. Thanks for watching. Max. 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 Max.
Uh, with your boobs? Uh. Oh. What's it covered with? What is this nasty slime? What are you doing? No, nothing. Nothing. Yeah. <laughs> 